moment. Okay, any questions? Alice? Uh, I was finding that in the Q&A link on modules that nothing was coming up. It was just a constant loading where I'm having no other problems in, in Canvas with anything else. Opening okay, up. so I'm going to change my share screen and let's see if we have the same problem uh, here. Oh, I'm sharing the whiteboard. So I'm going to go to my desktop. And I want to see if I can duplicate the problem because, uh, you know, we want to fix it. So I'm going to close this and go to 252. I'm going to scroll down to module one. And Q&A. So I get this thing here, open site and new window, because somehow, for some reason, or the Firefox doesn't deal with it very well. I'm using Safari, and I just get a blank screen. There's no error well, message. No one, you're the only person in the world who uses Safari. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll switch to Chrome and see the if that works. The only person. <laughs> and uh, there are 13 videos. Um, it should be. technically 15 videos, but I'm missing two and I'm not sure which two I'm missing. I know that one morning I forgot to record. So that's one of the that. reasons why we're missing a video. Yeah. But uh, I think the other should be there. So here's well, the morning I'll, one that I missed. I'll pull up uh, Chrome. Morning, afternoon. Ah, I'm missing the evening of the 22nd. So I need to post that. Okay. Do you have well, just a YouTube channel there um, in case I can't get it to function through the Q&A for some reason? Well, it's... what I would do if I were you is I would get to this point right here and uh, copy this uh, address. I don't, I don't really have you... a, I've got a I have split... YouTube, but I don't know if it's a channel. I don't know much about YouTube. I just I just post stuff and go from there. So here, let me see. Here's my channel. And my channel has a whole bunch of playlists. And I guess if you type in College of the Redwoods dash chemistry, you'll probably get there. I think I have. Yeah. Okay. So it's it seems to be appropriately named. Okay, so yeah, don't use Safari. No one uses Safari. All right, I'll just get it off my computer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in Canvas, it's working, so. Mac, Mac people love their Macs, but they don't use Safari. Okay, I'll use Chrome. Uh, we don't like Chrome either. Okay, I'll download Firefox next. You like Firefox. <laughs> I mean, because have you seen the little symbol for Firefox? It's so cute. Yeah, it is. It's but so my, cute. my other class, they're telling me use Chrome, so. You should probably use Chrome, but Mac users don't like Chrome either. <laughs> okay, Firefox. Uh, Chrome is probably better, but I don't like it. Neither does my other class leader, but that's what she needs to use, so. Yeah, for exams, I have to use Chrome. All right, that being said, let me change uh, my share back to me so you can see me, which I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. Yeah, we can handle it. How do I get rid of this or move it around? There we go. Okay, so hopefully you see me now. I don't see me. Oh, we can still see your screen. You're still sharing your tab on your computer. Your web page. Web page. Oh, I put pause share. That should have stopped it, I thought. Let's see now. Yeah, I don't know how to get back to not sharing. 
So I'm going to go to here and I'm going to share my desktop because eventually that's where we're going to go. And here you can see my, my huge container of cinnamon tea. And here you can see my hot coffee. And here you can see my dry skin. I need some lotion. Look at that. That's horrible. Okay. So now that we've taken care of that, Alice, and you've found the videos, does anyone have another question? I have a quick question. Can you tell me again about significant figures and measurements? Uh, what remember. would you like to know about significant figures and measurements specifically? Well, um, I think you said that they have, is it an infinite amount of significant figures? Pardon me? Is it an infinite amount of significant figures for a measurement? No, measurements have a limited number of significant figures. There are two types of things that have an infinite number of significant figures. So let me write that down. And can everyone see what I'm writing on here? We good for that? Yeah. So whenever I ask questions, just give me a yes or a no, or just give me some sort of signal through the uh, participant list. And uh, significant figures. So just a very quick review here even though you didn't ask for it. So these are the things that are significant. Non-zeros, tweener zeros, trailing zeros with a decimal, Uh, leading zeros are not, oops, so this is not significant. Leading zeros, so that's zeros to the left, and trailing zeros without a decimal. Now, there's also things that have an infinite number of significant figures. Counted within reason. and defined. So examples of defined, 2.54 centimeters is one inch. You should memorize this one. One centimeter cubed is equal to one inch, or excuse me, one milliliter. That's defined, you should memorize that one. Uh, you probably know a few others, 12 inches is equal to one foot. Uh, one yard is equal to three feet. Metric conversions are exact. So if you have 100 centimeters is equal to one meter, that's exact, that's defined. The one has infinite number of zig figs, the 100 has an infinite number of zig figs. Also, any conversion, any conversion written like this, the one has infinite number of zig figs, the other side does not, this has three zig figs. The reason this does not have an infinite number of zig figs is because this is not defined. So I'm gonna put a little line between that. <clears throat> but whenever you see a conversion where there's a one, that one is technically exact. So we're saying approximately 0.946 liters is exactly one quart. And the better way to say it would be actually exactly one quart is about 0.946 liters. And you wanna say it with that kind of you know, rise in, in tone, because that way you sound friendly. Charlotte, does that help out at all? I think so. Um, so like when you're measuring something, it's never exact. It can never be exact because let's say that you use a ruler and you measure yourself to be 5.5 .5 foot tall. That's five, six, right? And it seems that you're right at the six. So you have to take into account, are you in your bare feet? Are you standing up as straight as you can? Is the measurer measuring you correctly? Are you using the instrument correctly? Because maybe you could measure better than 5.5. Uh, but there's going to be a limit to how precise you can be because 
of the, the units on the measuring device. Even with digital devices, they don't have an unlimited number of digits. Our calculators seem to have an unlimited number of digits, but our calculators are just designed to uh, report you the problem and the answer and give you as many digits as you can, regardless of whether they're significant. So everything that's measured has a limited number of significant figures. And that's our job to figure out how many. And also when writing down a number to report the correct number of significant figures. Okay. Are we good now, Charlotte, you think? Yeah. Now, if, if you find that you have another question or you wanna add more or ask some more about this, ask again, okay? Fair enough? Okay, so I'm gonna put that to the side. What's next? Anyone have a question? Okay, if you don't have any questions, we're just gonna end this session and we'll see you later. Okay, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Don't go away. We had left off yesterday on um, problem 16, which occupies a larger volume. And so we're gonna continue with some end of the chapter problems in chapter one. And we're gonna be looking at number 18 now. And we basically have problems all the way up to number 66. So this is what we're gonna be doing. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. That's what we normally do on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This is Tuesday. It's lab day. So I need to talk about the lab. Now, when you are uh, flustered or confused by what's going on, like Tony said he's gonna do labs on Tuesdays and Thursdays and now he's not, you need to remind me because I'm an old man and I forget what I'm doing. So I'm gonna change my share screen uh, to Firefox. Okay, that means I can put this camera out of my face. And I'm going to go to uh, module one. And we're going to look at the measurements lab. And I'm going to walk you through the things you need to do. I think I've written it well enough that you should be able to do this without actually being in this session, but uh, nonetheless, let's go ahead and take a look at that. So you can see that for this, you're supposed to uh, write this up in your lab notebook, title, intro, safety procedure, etc. In this introduction, my bullet points would be, in this lab, we're going to learn how to determine density. And then I would put down, you determine the mass by using a scale. Or actually, I would put down Density is mass divided by volume. I would actually write the formula out. And then I would write down that um, you measure mass by using a scale. And you can measure the volume by uh, using a geometric equation if it's a regular shape, or you could use volume displacement. And you don't need to describe what in, what's entailed in each of those. Uh, and then you're going to say, and we're going to practice this with pennies and dimes. And we've been told that pennies and dimes are made out of uh, copper and zinc. And since pennies look like copper, I think pennies are made out of copper. And since dimes look like zinc, I think dimes are made out of zinc. And when we're done with this lab, we'll compare the, uh, the density that we get for the pennies and the density that we get for the dimes with the density that we find online for copper and zinc and see if our hypothesis is true. So that would be the kind of things you put in your introduction, kind of the background, what you're gonna be doing, how you're gonna be doing it, but not the detail, the big picture, how you're gonna do it. And uh, you know, you're finally your goal, we're gonna, we're gonna finally use these densities to see if copper or pennies are copy, copper and uh, dimes are zinc, okay? For the safety in this particular region, you wanna look at what I write for safety. And here you can see that, oh, I didn't write a safety section. 
So that means it's up to you to figure out the safety issues. So if we take a look at the procedure, that's where you're going to find out if there's safety issues. For your water, you mash your graduated cylinder while it's empty and dry. Uh, you count out 50 pennies, you put them in the graduated cylinder, you measure the dimensions of it. You can tell here that there are no safety issues related to this lab. So if I don't write a little safety section in here, it's for you to decide what the safety issues are. And here you would write down safety. There are no safety issues for this lab. This procedure is pretty set. So you could actually write out the procedure in your lab notebook, just like this. There are certain things that I would leave out of this like uh, you should be able to measure your graduation if your graduations are one milliliter, that part. You don't need to write that out. You just need to write, mash your graduated cylinder when it's empty and dry, add 40 milliliters of water approximately, measure the volume, mass the cylinder with the water. That's it. I have uh, a question really if, quick. Yeah. So for the introduction, is it okay if we write it in bullet points or do you want us to write it in complete sentences? Oh, my suggestion is bullet points because it's okay. just faster. Okay. It does not need to be complete sentences. Uh, the idea of the lab notebook is that if you open that lab notebook up again, a hundred years from now, that's great. Cause that means you're over a hundred years old. <laughs> Congratulations. Secondly, if you're of sound mind, you should be able to look at that lab notebook and repeat the lab and get the same results. Okay, but more gotcha. importantly, if someone else opens up that lab notebook in a hundred years and they weren't alive now because they're born later, they should be able to repeat the experiment and get the same results or similar results. That's the whole point of a lab notebook. So bullet points are just fine in the introduction. <clears throat> okay. But Thank since you. you've asked this, are you a uh, Darley? Yeah. Okay, do you like to be called Darley? Yeah. Okay, great. However, there is one thing in this uh, class called a lab report. Mm -hmm. And a lab report is like this, only it's written as a story, not bullet points. Okay. So you will have to do that once for a lab that you've written up like this in bullet points. I like bullet points, as you can see, I like bullet points. Yeah. But you can see that for my intro, <clears throat> I didn't really do a whole lot of bullet points. Uh huh. Okay. Is that lab report going to be like at the end of the semester? It's in the middle. No. I don't want too much stuff crammed at the end of the semester. Because <clears throat> at the end of the semester, you're going to have exam four. You're going to have the final exam. You're going to have a lab due. You're going to have a whole lot going on. Plus, you're going to have a whole lot going on with your other classes. <clears throat> So what I do is I make that uh, lab report due in the middle of the semester. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so let's move on. I'm gonna go back to what you wanna write up. So the procedure we have, the data you can see is based on the procedure. You're gonna have the mass of the graduated cylinder, the mass of the graduated cylinder with water, the volume of water in the graduated cylinder and so forth. And that's just to get practice weighing things and measuring things. And uh, also to get practice getting the mass of something by difference. Not only can you get the volume by difference, but you can get the mass by difference. The calculations are gonna be based on the assignment. And I'm gonna, I've said this before, but I'm gonna repeat it. Uh, you can do the calculations in the calculation section and in the assignment, you can say, refer to the first calculation, refer to the second calculation. You don't need to rewrite the calculation for your assignment. The results in this case are gonna be the densities pretty much. And then your discussion is gonna be, well, you know, if the first thing you're gonna do with your discussion is you're gonna say, we found the density of uh, pennies to be blank using volume displacement we found the density of pennies to be blank using a geometric shape. And then you do the same thing for dimes. And then you would say, when we compare those values uh, to the real density or, or actually to the density of zinc and copper, we find out that 
A, the density of copper does match that of pennies. And so pennies are made out of copper and the density of zinc matches that of dimes. So dimes are made out of zinc. Or you might find the opposite, which seems weird that pennies are made out of zinc and dimes are made out of copper, which made me do a Scooby-Doo. Also, you're gonna compare densities where you find one by volume by displacement and one by geometric shape. You're gonna compare those densities and, and see which one you believe more. And I'm not gonna tell you which one you should believe more, but there's a reason why you might believe one over the other, okay? I was wondering, what do you mean by um, geometric dimension under the calculus? Okay, I'm gonna change my share screen, okay? By geometric shape, I'm gonna go back just a little bit here. And I'm gonna write down that density is mass divided by volume. We're gonna measure the mass by using a scale and we're gonna get the volume by displacement. And by geometric shape. So I'm gonna to go to my penny jar. I'm gonna pull out a penny and there is a penny. So when we look at this penny, to me, it looks like a circle with a certain amount of thickness here. So it's a circle. And if I draw it looking at it from the side, kind of from the side, it looks like this. So that is a cylinder. And uh, most of us, when we see a flattened cylinder, we call it a disc. So a disc is when it's not very tall and a cylinder usually is for something that's really tall. And there is no cutoff between what's a cylinder, what's a disc. Let's not belabor that point. Call it a disc, call it a cylinder. The area of the penny is going to be, or excuse me, the volume of the penny is going to be the area times the height. Where that is the height, we would normally call that thickness and the circle part is the area. So that's gonna be pi r squared times the height. And of course the radius is half the diameter of the penny. So I'm gonna rewrite this as pi d squared h over four. And so you can see for the geometric shape, you want the height of the penny and the diameter of the penny. So you're gonna take out your little trusty metric ruler. And because we want the density in grams per cubic centimeter, you're gonna measure things in centimeters. So you're gonna measure the diameter and you're gonna measure the thickness, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna get some number here. I'm gonna call this volume by geometry versus volume by displacement. So when you calculate the density of the penny, you're gonna take the mass of the penny, which you only get one way and divide it by the volume that you get from displacement. But you're also gonna do this by the volume you get from the geometric shape. Okay. And hopefully these two are close to one another, but chances are they will be a little bit different. And you gotta decide which one you believe more uh, based on what you've done and your observations. Why is the volume divided by four? Well, because do you buy into this part here, pi r squared d h? Are you okay with that? Yeah. 
area times height, and yeah. that's the area of a circle. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to write this. You buy into that? Okay, yeah. Now, radius is the diameter divided by two. Mm -hmm. So if you buy into this above, then you should buy into that. Yeah. Now the diameter squared is diameter squared. And what's two squared? Four. So that's why it is this. And the reason I like this formula better than this one is uh, when you get the diameter and you half it, you might accidentally lose a significant figure. But if you put the diameter in here and the height in here, you're not going to lose any significant figures. Okay? Okay. So that's what I mean by geometric shape. All right. I'm going to go back and go back to the lab. So I'm going to do a chain share screen. So um, naturally, the volume by dimension and the volume by, I should say, the volume by displacement and the volume by geometric shape, uh, you want to show sample calculations there? OK, so I'm going to go scroll down. And uh, we pretty much have all the calculations here. You'll notice. I have you calculating the volume of the penny by water displacement, the volume of one penny by geometric dimension. Uh, calculate the density of the pennies. Uh, and then it says basically the same three things for dimes. So here, pennies, 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 dimes, dimes, dimes. Okay. And then you'll notice for the results, I want you to make a neat table for the densities. And then you can see that my discussion is kind of what I described it. The density of the pennies were found to be blah. Comparing these with uh, uh, the densities of zinc and copper, we find that blah. The original hypothesis was correct or incorrect. And then you want to give reasons why you think that is. Would we just use the density of copper and zinc found in the textbook to compare it to? Uh, yes, you can look at them in the text, but you can see here in the assignment, I've actually told you to go somewhere else. Okay. So if you take a look at, I mean, it's a great question. So I want you to see that number seven, and this brings up another point. This is a digression, but before you do the lab, you want to look at the assignment because the assignment gives you hints to things you're going to be doing and things to think about while you're doing. Like here, number one says a student puts the pennies in the Ziploc baggie so that they do not get wet during water displacement. How does this affect the uh, water displacement volume of the pennies, i.e. is the determined volume too large or too small? Explain. And my suggestion would be, well, the baggie has volume. So you're probably measuring the volume of the baggie along with the pennies. So the volume you're measuring is really the pennies and the baggies and, and the, the volume is too large. Yeah. And then number two would be, how would this affect the density? And I would say, well, if the volume is too small or too large, and it's in the denominator for calculating density, my density is going to be probably too small. Alice, go ahead. So I was curious about how that assignment ends up, if you want it in the lab manual, or is that something we're typing up and sending you the assignment portion? No. I just wasn't sure how you want that. I'll show you. It's a great question, but I usually address that towards the top. So do you see how this is right up the lab notebook? Yes. Submit the following photos. Got that, yeah. 
answer the questions at the end of the lab and submit answers. So the same way you're submitting sections of your lab notebook, you're submitting your answers. So you don't have to type them up. You can write them out on paper and submit them as a PDF file like you're submitting everything else. Would it be okay as long as I'm sending it all when I submit? I mean, that section, it was easier for me to copy, paste, and then type because it just flowed easier than writing it down in my lab manual. But that's why I'm asking, do you then, want it in the lab Then take a photo manual? of it. Take a photo of it like you do your meniscus. Okay. And make it into a PDF and submit it with the others. Okay. That's perfectly <laughs> fine. And uh, some people prefer typing over printing and that, that's fine. I'm, I'm on board with that, that's fine. Uh, the reason I don't do it is because it takes more time for me to type things out on a computer than just to print it. It's the opposite for me. So the lab manual okay. takes a lot of time. Whereas well, if I can just that's type it. You probably didn't take a typing class and I did. No, I took typing classes, but I also worked in an ER where I was hearing the doctors oh. and having to type for them. So that was fun. Oh, sounds like you were a medical uh, transcriber of some sort. I was, it's, it doesn't exist here. It was, it's a unit coordinator, but. Okay. All right, so can you see how the answers to one and two would not end up in calculations? Yeah. They yeah. would end up in the assignment. But look at number three and four. These also would not end up in calculations and neither would five. Now, number seven has convert the densities found on web elements from, and this is back to your question, Charlotte, about where do we get the densities from? I want you to go to web elements and this should say web elements.com. Okay. And let's go there so I can show you what I'm talking about. Okay. okay. Oops. So I'm going to go to web elements.com. This is a great site. It's a chemist dream. And here is copper, and I'm going to link to copper. I'm going to turn my mic down and uh, let's see, I'm going to move this over. You can see that there's a number of things here about copper. And as we scroll down, you can see that we have copper physical properties. And I'm going to see if I can enlarge this page or zoom in. And can you see that it gives you the uh, density of copper as eight, nine, two, zero kilograms meters to the minus three. And now I'm gonna change my share so that we can better understand what is being reported. So this is the way it's written. And for physicists, they don't like writing things in the denominator. So if there's something in the denominator, they'll move it to the numerator. Chemists, on the other hand, we don't have problems with putting stuff in the denominator. So let me show you how this would be written by a chemist, but I'm gonna convert it. When I multiply by meters cubed over meters cubed, I'm multiplying by one, so I'm not changing this amount. Uh, meters to the minus three times meters to the plus three is meters to the zero, which is one. So this is the way we would write it. And you would convert kilograms to grams and you would convert meters cubed to centimeters cubed for that particular problem that I asked. So this is just more practice using dimensional analysis and making conversions. Okay. And so this is why I say, you may have heard me say this before. 
So this is what this number represents. The identity law says if you divide something by one, it's still the same amount. And so here, that should be a negative. I said before, if you cross the line, you change the sign. So I'm gonna take meters to the negative three and cross the line and change the sign from a negative to a positive. And you can see I get the same result. So this is a common math trick, cross the line, change the sign. No one says cross the line, change the sign, but I do. In math, they say cross the vinculum, change the sign. Because the dividing line is called a vinculum. And if you memorize that, that's something none of your math teachers are gonna know. And that way you'll definitely be smarter than them because you know what it's called. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the uh, lab itself. Where is the lab? Oh, here. So you wanna do the same thing for uh, zinc. And what's neat about this is, do you see this little uh, thing on the left? You don't need to go back to the periodic table. You can go here and that'll take you to zinc. Okay. So I'm gonna change the wording in there where it says webelements.com so that that's not confusing. Okay. And then here, number eight, based on the evidence, what metal are pennies mostly made of and what metal are uh, dimes mostly made of? That's definitely something you wanna put into the conclusion. But this is probably something where you uh, could say, refer to the discussion uh, for this particular answer, or you could rewrite it because it's probably not very long. It's up to you. Look up the density of a penny minted after 1983 and calculate your percent error. Do we recall how to calculate percent error? Give me a thumbs up or a yes if you recall how to calculate percent error. I see one X, which means no. So I'm going to do a share screen where you can see my paper. And I'm going to show you how to calculate percent error. So percent error is equal to your experimental value minus the literature value. And this is the way we described it for years, literature value. But nowadays, it's becoming the internet value. A little bit of um, care must be taken when you go to the internet and look up these values. You want to go to a site that looks like it's uh, legitimate. So .govs, those tend to be pretty legitimate. Uh, dot edu they tend to be legitimate and you want to avoid those sites those sites that say like dot tony baloney because uh they're probably less likely to be legitimate they may be legitimate but you know you're opening up a can of worms so lit means literature i'm not trying to be cool by saying it's the lit value So when I have you do this, I'm actually going to be looking for your answer to see if it has the correct number of significant figures, because this is a great problem to practice for doing significant figures from subtraction and then doing significant figures from division. So steeped in this lab is practicing some of the stuff that we've learned before, because we're going to see that all through the semester. It almost sounds like this lab is well thought out. And honestly, it's probably not. Yeah, I just got lucky in some things. And I know probably you're not gonna remember vinculum and I'm gonna be disappointed. <clears throat> Try to remember that vinculum. You'll, be, you'll know something your math teacher doesn't. So let me go back to my new share and I'm gonna go back, <clears throat> excuse me, to the lab. Okay, and then lastly, number 10, that should be a calculation you put in calculations. Use the density of pennies. And here, 
I don't care which density you use, the one you determine experimentally or the real density of pennies and determine the cubic centimeter volume of 30 pounds of pennies. So, you know, uh, I was going to make this a two part question, but I just made it a one part question. So you can measure the mass of pennies here and I could figure out the the uh, the volume of pennies. Uh, but also we could presumably, if we know the density of pennies, we could calculate how many pennies are here. So we could we could uh, uh, guess how much this is worth. Probably the next time I write up this lab, I'll change that. So we're actually calculating how many pennies there are and seeing how close we get. Wait, we're not going to do that because that means I'd have to count the pennies and I'm not going to do that. Okay. Are there any questions about the lab for measurements? I just have a question. So if I'm writing up the assignment in my journal to keep it all together, do you want me to rewrite the question and then write the answer? Or should I just write the answer? Okay. Um, it's up to you as far as rewriting the question goes. I don't okay. care if you rewrite it or not. All right. Uh, I know that some English teachers, you know, and some science teachers say, rewrite the question and then write the answer. And the reason they're having you do that is because they don't remember what the question was. Right. And the reason I don't care is because I can open up this document. I can see the questions while I'm looking at your, your uh, answers. And so okay. I'm, I'm just prepared that way so that I don't have to make you do extra unnecessary work to make my life easier. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, but yeah. in some cases, it is a good idea to write the question out, especially if it's a weird question and the answer might not really let you know what the question asked. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. So you probably saw this. This is my cold coffee. Here's my hot. And then my cinnamon tea. Do you ever drink water, Tony? These are all made out of water, Charlotte. It's not. That wasn't the question, though. Well, are you asking about pure water or are you asking about water? Yeah, I'm drinking water right now. <laughs> pure water. Let's, let's talk like chemists, Charlotte. I'm drinking water. It's not pure water. It is a mixture, but I'm drinking water. Okay, fair enough. So do you want to re-ask that? Are you, do you ever drink pure water? Sure, I do. <laughs> but okay. in the morning, pure water doesn't really wake your, your rear end up. You know what I mean? <laughs> also, I'm an old man, so I have my vices, and I'm going to continue them until I die. Because um, I'm not interested in living to 100. Because I know what happened to my parents when they got old. They got frail. They couldn't handle it. I don't want that to happen to me. I want a car to take me out. And I want it to be instant so that I don't know what happened. Plus, you should be careful about drinking pure water because it means there's not enough minerals for your body to be absorbing. It can be pulling away. Yeah, but who does that, Alice? The only person I know of who did that was a person who was trying to win a car. What? It was a contest to see who could drink the most water, and the person who won died. Oh, shit. Because they diluted they didn't have their to body pay too out, much. Huh? What's that? <laughs> Guess they didn't have to pay out on that car. Well, I think they still won the car, but they died. <laughs> didn't do them much good. No, no. And I think this was actually in Sacramento, if I remember right. Oh, bummer. Um, but yeah, it was a, you know, one of those radio contests. Win a car. Okay, um, are there any questions you would like to ask about this lab? Uh, I have as the due date, uh, let's make a few edits as long as you all are here. I told you I needed to fix some things. So you can see me make these edits. So edit. There we go. 
So one of the edits was what? Webelements.com. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, it does say webelements.com. Why did I think it didn't? I think for number seven, it didn't. Yeah. Ah. But I did for number six. Okay, that looks good. You know what I should do is, uh, No, nah, I won't do that. All right. Okay, so I'm going to save this before I move on. And what I'd like to do now, since we still have time left over and I don't want to waste time and I want to help you out, we're going to go ahead and do some of the problems from the back of the chapter. Okay, and uh, if you kind of uh, want to, you know, tap out now, that's fine by me. Uh, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I'm lying, you're gonna hurt my feelings. But nonetheless, I'll understand. So I'm gonna change my share screen to my desktop. So you can see problem number 18. Okay, so we have a two inch piece of chocolate cake with frosting provides 1,670 kilojoules of energy. What is this in dietary calories? So we want to take that 1,700 or 1,670 kilojoules and probably turn that into joules, turn that into calories, and then turn that into kcals. And the reason for that is we know that uh, 1,000 joules is one kcal kilojoule, my apologies, 1,000 joules is one K joule. And that comes from this. And I wanna take a moment to look at this and prove that it is correct. So you're given some conversion, you don't know if it's correct or not, or you come up with some conversion and you don't know if it's correct or not. There's a way to check it. And the way to check it is to get rid of all the prefixes and substitute numbers for it. So here, we're gonna check this. So we have 1000 joules is equal to one kilojoule. I'm just rewriting it here. Now I'm gonna write 1000 joules is equal to one times 10 to the third joules because K literally means 10 to the third. And we're like, what I should be saying is K numerically is 10 to the third. And if I take this and write it in decimal form instead of exponential form, I get 1000. So this is a check, they equal. Now let's say that someone writes down that one times 10 to the six millimeters is equal to one nanometer. So this is something that you may or may not know as being correct. Uh, I know it's wrong. Let's check it. So I'm going to write one times 10 to the six millimeters is equal to one nanometer. And now I'm going to write one times 10 to the six times 10 to the minus three meters is equal to one times 10 to the minus nine meters. 10 to the six times 10 to the minus three is 10 to the three because we add powers. And when we're done here, this says that one times 10 to the three meters is equal to one times 10 to the minus nine meters. Is this correct? That's a yes or no. Is that correct? No. Yeah. No. So that means this is not correct. Now let's try this. One millimeter 
is one times 10 to the minus six nanometers. I want you to check this one out and see if it works. Oh, excuse me, 10 to the positive six. So take your time, check this one and see if it works out and give me a signal that you're done when you're done. Oh my goodness, that program was brief. It only lasted like an hour. Something you could do every day. Okay, I'm not seeing any responses. So that means you're still working. So I'm gonna, while you're still working, make me another cup of hot coffee. Okay, I'm looking for at least two people to signal that they're ready to move on before we move on. So I'm looking at the participant list. I see one thumbs up. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on here and show you that this does work out. So a milli is 10 to the minus three. A nano is 10 to the minus nine. Ten to the minus or 10 to the plot positive six times 10 to the minus nine is 10 to the negative three because you add exponents. So this one does check out. Okay, so let's go back to the problem. And we're gonna convert 1670 kilojoules to joules, then to calories, and then to kcals. So I've got one, two, three conversions I need to do. And the first conversion, we're going to use 1,000 joules is equal to 1 k joule. The second conversion is one that you're just going to have to memorize. It's not exact. It's not defined. But it is uh, one calorie is approximately 4.184 joules. I have a question. Yes. Why is this? Equality not defined or exact. Well, uh, because uh, the calorie was defined without considering the joule, and the joule was defined without considering uh, the calorie. The joule was defined by a, a man who came up with a way to measure energy. Uh, and he did it based, I can't remember what he did it based on, uh, but it had nothing to do with water. One calorie is based on how much energy it takes to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius. 
Okay. So because the calorie is based off of water and the joule is not, they don't end up being exact. Okay. And that's the reason. Okay. And then we have 1,000 calories is equal to 1 kcal. So these are the three conversions I want to use. So here... I'm going to use my first conversion, my second conversion, and my third conversion. And remember, the way we decide how to use these is we do the following. One of these will go in the denominator, and the other will go in the numerator. We make our decision based on what we want to cancel. And remember, this number here can be written like that so that we know it's in the numerator. We don't want to do this because that changes the value, right? So we know that's in the numerator. So I want to put one kilojoule in the denominator and 1,000 joules in the numerator. Now, since these values are equal, when I have this divided by this, that's equal to one. I'm multiplying by one. The golden rule of math is if you multiply by one, you don't change anything. You don't change the amount. So this will get rid of the kilojoules. And this is why a lot of people call this dimensional analysis. Kilojoules is a dimension. And you can cancel these. It's also called unit analysis because kilojoule is a unit. So we're using units to analyze how to use our conversion. So our next conversion, if we want to cancel joules, I'm going to put 4.184 joules in the bottom, one calorie in the top, and the joules cancel. And lastly, for this last one, I'm going to put 1,000 calories in the bottom and one kilocalorie in the top so that calories cancel. You can see in this problem, 1,000 divided by 1,000 is 1. 1,670 divided by 4 is basically um, close to what? Uh, 16 divided by 4 is 4. So I would guess that this number would be around 400 or mm -hmm. a little bit more because it's 1,670. So I've got an idea in my head of what the answer should be before I plug this into my calculator. And 1670 divided by 4.184. And my calculator has 399.1395. And here, this has three zig figs. This has four zig figs. All the rest of these, because these are metric conversions, they're exact, and this one is exact. So we're allowed three significant figures, and we get 399 kcals. Now, since this is Chem 1A, I'm going to show you a more advanced way to do this. And it has to do with this. One calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. So I'm going to write... 1 kcal is equal to 4.184 kilojoules. I multiplied the left by a k. I multiplied the right by a k. So this is good. So now I'm going to take my 1670 kilojoules and multiply by 4.184 kilojoules over 1 kcal. And you can see that we get the same answer. So on an exam, if I actually do a problem like this, I don't expect to see one, two, three, but I expect to see this work right here or this work right here. Both would be fine. I don't need to see this work. I don't need to see this work. Are we ready to move on? Give me a signal that you're ready to move on. If I yeah. get two out of four, I'm moving on. Okay, I'm moving on. Okay, let's look at number 20. A can of soft drink provides uh, 130 calories. 
a bottle of mixed berry juice provides 630 kilojoules, um, which provides the greater total energy. Notice that this calorie is an uppercase. So we're talking about food calories, 130 food calories, which provides the greater total energy and which provides the greater energy per milliliter. So for this problem, we have 130 calories and that's for the soft drink. And for the juice, we have 630 kilojoules. So we need to either turn that into kilojoules or turn that into uppercase calories. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the top and then I'll do the bottom. So for the top, we need to know that one uppercase calorie is actually one kcal. And we also learned that one kcal is 4.184 kj from the previous problem. So for the drink, I can take my 130 calories and I can multiply by one cal, uppercase, not lowercase, and 4.184 kilojoules. And we get a value that's gonna be four times 100, which is 400, four times 30, which is about 120. So this value should be around 520, but a little bit more. And we get two significant figures because of the one three. So we get 540 kilojoules. So based on this answer, since 540 kilojoules is less than 630 kilojoules, which provides the greater total energy, we're going to say the juice. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert the 630 kilojoules into food calories. So I'm going to multiply by 4.184 kilojoules and one food calorie using the same conversion from up here, but a little bit different because I need things to cancel a little bit differently. So this answer should come out to be about 150 because 600 divided by four is 150. And so that will give us an idea of what the correct answer should be. And we get 150.5. So I wanna keep the one, I wanna keep the five. When I look at the next door number, it's a zero. So I round down and keep it 150. And here, since 150 calories is greater than 130 calories, and this is the juice, the juice has more energy. Okay, so that's the first part of the problem. And we might want to keep in mind these values or these values for the next part which provides the greater energy per milliliter. So I'm gonna take my juice value and if we wanna compare which has the greater energy per, per milliliter, we need to have the same energy unit. So I'm gonna say 150 uh, calories for the juice divided by so this is my juice, 150 food calories for the juice divided by 295 milliliters. And that's gonna be 150 divided by 295. And we get 0.51 calories per milliliter. 
And for the soft drink, we have 130 calories divided by 335 milliliters. And I can tell this answer is gonna be smaller right away. And I get 0 0.39 calories per milliliter. So it turns out that you get more calories per milliliter with the juice than with the soft drink, which proves to you that you shouldn't drink juice. It's too high in calories. You should drink soft drinks, right? So is that good science? You should drink soft drinks instead of juice because you get less energy per calorie. So you're less likely to gain weight by drinking soft drinks. Good science? No. How about this? Simple statement. You gain fewer calories per milliliter of soft drink than you get per milliliter of juice. Is that good science? And the answer is absolutely, because that is true based on these calculations. So the claim that it's better for you to drink soft drinks instead of juice is not something we can scientifically claim based on this evidence. We can simply claim that there's less energy per milliliter. To make the claim that the soft drink is gonna be better for you than the juice, we would have to do all sorts of experiments. First of all, we do have to define what, uh, what better means. Better for your health, better for your uh, uh, wallet, uh, and so forth and so on. I would gather that uh, better for your wallet would be the soft drink because it costs less. I would think better for your health would probably be the juice because it has a number of uh, vitamins in it that soft drinks don't. So to do science on this, we'd have to kind of define the parameters and then you'd come up with a hypothesis and then you would test it. Too many people abuse science because they will look at something like this and say, well, clearly drinking soda is better. But that's because they're not defining the parameters. And this is the problem I have with most uh, people who are making the claims like this is they don't define the parameters. And so, by, cap, by default, you think, well, it's in all cases. And this happens on news programs. This happens with politicians. This happens with people that you just meet on the street. Okay, so are there any questions about this particular problem? And here, we'd probably want to write down here that uh, juice, just to, just to put the cherry on top, juice provides more calories per milliliter, okay? And I would argue that juice is what you wanna drink if you're calorie deprived. Okay, let's move on to another problem. We have three more minutes, so we're gonna see what we can do here. The accepted value of the melting point of pure aspirin is 135 degrees Celsius. This is a yes or no question and you don't need to answer yes or no, just give me a signal that you have thought about the answer. Is this defined and therefore an infinite number of zig bigs? So just give me a signal that you thought about it. Does that have an infinite number of significant figures? Okay, I've got two hands. So now we're gonna answer the question. The answer is this is something that's accepted. So that means it's measured. And therefore this only has three significant figures. The reason I'm pointing this out to you is that a lot of people think that if you have no decimal there, that that number is defined. And 
it's not the case. So this has three significant figures. You're trying to verify that value. You obtain 134, 136, 133, and 138 in four separate trials. Your partner finds 138, 137, 138, and 138. Calculate the average value and percent error for your data and your partner's data, which is more precise and which is more accurate. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna write the data out. You, 134, 136, 133, and 138. Now I put the degrees Celsius at the top because that means it applies to everything in the column below. And I don't have to write degrees Celsius four times. Partner gets a 138, 137, 138, and 138. So to average these, you add all the values together. And I know that when I add these together, I should get a little over 500 because I have 400 there and this adds up to like 150. So I get 541. And then I'm gonna take that value and divide it by four values that I've added together to get the average. And I'm gonna to round to three significant figures. So this is the average. This one, I can tell right away that the average is 138. Because when I add these all up, that 137 is not gonna change things very much. Okay, so we can actually answer the first question, which one is more accurate? You can tell that you are more accurate because you're closer to the 135. But for the accuracy, you actually want to do a percent error. So you percent error is equal to 135 degrees Celsius minus 135 degrees Celsius over 135 degrees Celsius times 100%, which is equal to 0% error. And for your partner, the percent error, I'm going to just put percent E, is 138 degrees Celsius minus 135 degrees Celsius. Notice I'm putting my units in for all of my calculations. You're seeing me do that again and again. And this is something I expect on your test. Now, this is a great problem for deciding how many significant figures we're gonna need at the end. And you see how 138 minus 135 is three. This is good to the ones, this is good to the ones, this is good to the ones. So this difference has one significant figure. Now, if this difference has one significant figure, and this has three significant figures, and this is infinity because this is defined, we are allowed one significant figure in our answer. And so we get point, oops. And so we get 2%, and that is our percent error. For accuracy, smaller percent error, more accurate. Now, for precision, the one that is most precise is the one with the smaller average deviation. But also, uh, this takes a lot of work to do. A lot of times, you can actually determine the precision based on the smaller range. And this doesn't always work, but it often works. So if you're in a pinch for time, you take a look here and you look at which one has the smallest range. So I'm going to put range up here. This range goes from 133 to 138. So the range is five degrees Celsius. Here, the range is one degree Celsius. 
So based on this, the partner is more precise. Now for the average deviation, what you do is you find the deviation from the average. So the average for this one is 135. The deviation is one degree Celsius. Here it's one degree Celsius, here it's two, here it's three. And here the deviation from the average is zero, one, zero, zero. So you add these up, you get two, four, seven, here you get one. And then you divide by the number of values. So your average deviation for the first one is seven divided by four, which is gonna be two. And then you have one divided by four, which is going to be zero. Hey, Tony. Pardon me? Uh, hey, I'm sorry, but can you explain standard deviation again real quick? This is not standard deviation, it's average deviation. Okay, so the step So the deviation is the difference between this value and your average. Okay, oh, okay. And we don't care whether it's a positive difference or a negative difference, we just, the absolute value of the difference. Okay. So do you see why these are zeros when the average is 138? Yeah. So that's how you calculate your average deviation is you just get the deviation and then average them. Okay. So that means that this combined together, you would get 135 degrees Celsius plus or minus two degrees Celsius. For this one, you get 138 degrees Celsius plus or minus zero degrees Celsius. And here, this is less precise and this is more precise because it's the same with accuracy, smaller percent area or percent error, more precise, smaller deviation, average deviation, more precise. But notice that we got the same result by looking at the range. Now here's something that I want you to know is I'm not gonna ask you on an exam to calculate average deviation, but I might ask you which one is more precise. And in this case, when you have multiple values, you're gonna use range, smaller range, more precise. So we've gone uh, over the amount of time I wanted to spend on this, but we got through some decent problems on uh, the end of the chapter stuff. So we'll start on number 24 tomorrow if you're in the morning session. And uh, if you can't come to the morning session, we don't always start at the same place in the afternoon session. You can view those Q and A's uh, online. So thank you for attending. And uh, at the end of every session, I have you turn on your mics. Oh, uh, maybe we have a question. Charlotte, do you have a question? No, just thank you. Okay, so at the end, I like everyone to turn on their mics and say goodbye to each other. Goodbye. Bye, Bye everyone. Hopefully I see you again. <laughs>